What's up, everyone? Welcome to Matt's Mishmash Podcast. In today's episode, I want to explore the notion that we are all citizens of the world, and that, for all of the things that separate us, whether geographical, ideological, cultural, or otherwise, there are far more that we have in common with one another. Our joys and our struggles, our pleasure and our pain, they're all universal, and that realization allows the world to feel like a much smaller place. The revelation that we are all residents of a far bigger realm didn't really come into play for me until I went to college. At the time, I was less concerned with where I was going to go and more worried about how I was going to pay for it. I had no interest in taking out student loans, and I had no savings to pay for tuition outright, so I was totally reliant upon a scholarship. Fortunately, I graduated at just the right time. As fate would have it, the City University of New York was debuting a new program in the fall of 2001 called the CUNY Honors College. It was designed to draw high-performing students away from Ivy League schools. Among some of the perks that were included were a free laptop, an expense account, a cultural passport to the city's many museums, and, most important of all, a full tuition scholarship. Students would apply to a home school, in my case Baruch College, but we would interact using the Graduate Center as a base of operations. We had a cross-campus project that we would work on each semester with students from the other CUNY schools, including Hunter College, City, Brooklyn, and Queens, among others. In essence, we were using the city as our campus, not merely the setting for our education, but an active source of it. I had attended James Madison High School, which, all things considered, was pretty diverse. I had friends from all over the cultural spectrum, including many who were first or second generation Americans. Still, it wasn't until I got to Baruch that I began to realize just how big the world was. Stepping into the library building and looking up, I was awed by the sight of so many flags, each one representing the culture of a Baruch student. As of August 2021, Baruch's student body has hailed from 155 different countries, with over 109 languages spoken on campus. When I attended, my friends covered the cultural spectrum, spanning the globe from Nigeria to Greece, from Spain to China, Croatia, and beyond. Though our respective ethnic backgrounds would come up in conversation from time to time, I realized that there were other factors that influenced our discussions far more. Students from Brooklyn Tech and Stuyvesant had an intense rivalry, as did those of us from Brooklyn and that other borough you drive through before you get to Nassau County. We got along fine with Manhattanites and our Bronx brethren, but there was one other place that I can't think of where a few students lived. I can't remember it offhand, but I'm sure it'll come to me. I feel like I'm always forgetting this borough. Anyway, my time as an honor scholar made me appreciate the rich diversity in the backgrounds of my peers, and the fact that any differences in our cultural traditions were dwarfed by the similarities in our daily lives, particularly as commuter students to Baruch. Until that point, I never really thought of myself as a kid from Brooklyn, though I did take pride in that. From then on, though, I couldn't help but realize that, more than anything, I was a global citizen merely representing one place out of many. Sure, I was from Brooklyn, but that was just one part of a much larger city in New York, and even then, New York City was only one municipality in a far longer list. It was this broadened perspective, I believe, that helped me once I entered the classroom as an instructor. It enabled me to relate much more easily with students, regardless of their backgrounds and circumstances. I was always able to find a commonality, some point through which I could bond with them, and it's something that has allowed me to flourish in social settings far beyond the schools and office buildings I've worked in. I never considered, though, that it would impact me as a writer in quite the way that it has. See, way back in 2002 when I started writing my first novel, The Lion in the Desert, I thought of writing as a very personal, isolated activity. Writers are notoriously introverted, and sitting alone at a computer, I could understand the appeal, even though I never felt the need to be so insular. At the time, my only goal was simply to finish writing the book. I didn't give much thought to what would come later. And then, all of a sudden, I had a completed novel and the need to decide what the heck to do with it. I had some very supportive friends and family who were interested in checking out my work, one of those aforementioned things that I hadn't thought of. At the time, all I wanted was a printed copy that I could have as a keepsake. I wasn't interested in querying, pursuing a literary agent or a publishing deal, because I had no idea whether or not what I wrote would even warrant that. Still, there was enough interest that I felt like I needed to find a way to get copies into the hands of those kind souls who believed in me. Independent publishing was still highly frowned upon, a topic for a future episode. And so I found what I thought was essentially a vanity press, a company that would print my book for me and enable friends and family to purchase copies for themselves. As part of the process, a cover needed to be created. I had two options. I could outsource it entirely to the company, or I could provide a starting point in the form of an image and allow them to work off of that. It didn't feel right to go with the former, and so I looked through some of my recent photographs. Initially, I wanted to go with something desert-related, 
but the images I found online all needed commercial licenses, money I didn't have and wasn't willing to spend at the time. And so I decided to look through my own collection of photographs. Heather and I had taken a recent trip to Watkins Glen, and while hiking along the massive path, I just so happened to stop behind a waterfall. I turned back and took a picture of the creepy twisting stairwell behind me. As soon as I saw this photo, I was taken to a part in the book where one of the villains descends into an underground bunker. It was perfect, and so I sent it in, and they created the cover. I was off and running. By the time I finished the second book, though, it was clear that I had made an enormous error going with this company, and after an enervating fight that only narrowly avoided the court system, I was able to escape their clutches. For the first time since I started my writing journey, I was completely free, but also entirely responsible for my creative output. This was also right around when I found myself as a stay-at-home parent, and so I decided that the time was finally right to take this writing journey seriously. Initially, I felt like I needed to have a traditional publishing deal in order to call myself a writer, but after a very long stretch of soul-searching, I realized that my calling was as an indie writer. It was the path that gave me the greatest degree of creative control, and boy was there a lot to control. By 2016, I was ready to begin building my personal brand as a writer. To do this, though, I knew I would need a website, a logo, and marketing materials that I could put out there. Having zero artistic ability, I knew that I would need to cobble something together with already existing images. I wanted something that involved a quill, and so I set about searching for the right picture. I found something that looked like it would work, and so I reached out to the artist. Indra Halka was incredibly generous and gave me the green light to use her creation. She also happened to hail from Latvia, the homeland of my Uncle Pete's side of the family. After deciding that I wanted to go in a slightly different direction with my design, I stumbled upon the absolute perfect image, one that included a quill, a spilled ink jar, and crows. This one I had to license to use, but again, the artists wound up being really cool. Summon the Shaman, the collective that they were a part of, was based in both France and Italy, and I wound up corresponding with one of those artists too. I was slowly building some connections around the world, but the best were yet to come. In 2017, I arranged a multi-state book tour in support of my first piece of nonfiction, Beer and Fitness, but also with the hopes of selling some of my novels. I wound up selling through all of the stock that I had initially purchased, so I added a few dates and picked up some more materials. By the end of that, I had only a few copies left of each of the books, and so I decided to take advantage of a program called Goodreads Giveaways. Through the giveaways, I was able to give users the chance to win those free copies. The best part, though, was that I was able to specify which regions could participate, and so I set up giveaways on every continent except Antarctica. It was always my dream to have my books in every corner of the world, and this opportunity allowed me to do just that. A few months later, I was contacted by the winner from South Africa. He said that he loved the book, and that he thought I would be a perfect fit for this Facebook group that he operated. It was an international meeting place for readers and writers alike, called Books and Everything. Through my participation there, I made some of my closest writing friends, and I gained an appreciation for the universality of the written word. Authors like Sarah Key and Melina Lewis allowed me to glimpse what life is like halfway around the world, while Rashida Khan transformed pure emotion into poetry. Sean Clavin showed me that horror is a language unto itself, one that is spoken the world over. I found myself as a figurative and literal member of a global creative community that I never even realized existed, and I loved it. And then there was Andre. Right around the time I was beginning to research my various visual needs, I finished the manuscript for my third novel. I didn't have a concrete idea of what I wanted in terms of a cover, but I knew one thing. It had to be dark. The Metamorphoses is about the descent of a small mountain town into darkness, but also the darkness that lives within people. I had signed up for emails from a website called Creative Market, something I never do and rarely did even back then. One October morning in 2016, I opened one of these emails and saw a mysterious forest Halloween pack being advertised that offered a half dozen free images. Again, I almost never looked at these types of emails, and even less frequently clicked through, but something made me follow that link, and it was a decision I'll be forever grateful for. The breath caught in my throat as an image from a user named Photocosma popped up. It was eerie and ethereal, beautifully dark and haunting. I loved it, and I knew that I had to use it, whether as the novel's cover or as some sort of promotional image. I reached out to the creator to tell him how awesome I thought his work was, and to inquire about the usage possibilities. While I awaited a response, I began to explore his catalog of work. Each image made my jaw drop further towards the floor. I couldn't believe the creativity that he employed, and I was envious of his ability to evoke beauty from the shadows in ways I could only dream of doing as a photographer myself. To say that he is on another level wouldn't do that disparity justice. Simply put, he's in a league all his own. 
By the time he responded, I had found several other images that I hoped to use, and so we opened a dialogue that has continued to and through this day. We quickly realized that we had a lot in common, not just in terms of photographic principles and preferences, but just life in general. We connected on Facebook and began corresponding. I asked him about where he took these incredible photos, and that was when he told me that he lived in Romania. Not only that, but he lived in Transylvania. Are you kidding me? As a lifelong fan of horror novels, and just the macabre in general, I turned into a total fanboy. I couldn't believe my luck. Not only had I discovered what I believe to be one of the greatest photographers living in the world today, but someone who lived in the most renowned place of darkness in film and literature. The more we conversed, the more apparent it became that we had eerily similar interests and tastes in everything from music, writing and movies, to just views of the world. He's still one of my favorite people to speak with, and I am so, so lucky to be able to say that he is my guest today on the Mishmash podcast. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Andre Cosma. Andre, my friend, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. So why don't you tell us how you got started in photography? Was it something that you were always interested in, or perhaps like me with playing music, is it something that developed closer to adulthood? Well, I've always liked visual things like drawing, painting, and comics. So uh, when I was a kid, I actually loved photography because uh, of the way it captures a moment in time that would otherwise be lost forever. Did you use a film camera or did you jump straight into digital photography? My parents got me a film camera as a birthday gift when I was 10 years old, I think. So yeah, that kind of cemented my love for the visual arts. And uh, years later, when uh, consumer digital cameras appeared, I continued doing photography first as a kind of hobby. And then since 2008, I managed to turn it into something more serious. That's great. So would you say that's your primary creative outlet? Well, I draw a little bit, but I'm not that good at it. So yeah, I'd say photography is my main creative outlet. Now, I know that setting plays a huge role in photography and where you shoot is really the first thing that drew me to your work. So not only do you live in Romania, but you live where in Romania specifically? Well, I live in what used to be called Transylvania. Oh, that, that's incredible. Now, for the average American over here, I think they picture vampires. For me, I'm thinking of really foreboding mountains, dark forests, and of course, the requisite castles. How would you describe the region? Well, it's a great place. There's a lot of history. So the castle that you mentioned are present. A lot of ruins dating back to 2000 years ago, maybe, and beyond. And also a lot of medieval fortresses. Uh, most of them are in ruins, but the spirit is, is still there. Most of the work that I've seen from you focused in forests, and you capture that spirit of, I guess, a haunted woodlands so perfectly. What is it like to shoot in those woods or just around Transylvania in general? Well, actually, the name Transylvania roughly translates as beyond the forest. So it seems that the forests were always an important part of the region. So thankfully, we still have some today, not as big as they used to be, but still nice. And together with my brother, we try to find as much information as we can about a certain place that we might find interesting from travel blogs, if they are available, or if no info is, av is available, we use a lot of maps because getting access to some of the area is pretty hard. The roads are not the best over here. That was something I was curious about. What are some of the challenges of, of shooting there? Would you be able to walk us through perhaps a typical photography trip that you and your brother might take? Sure. So because the roads are not the best over here, we have to plan accordingly. And uh, we try to get as, clo as close as possible by road. But then we have to walk pretty long distances to get to the actual place that we want to photograph. Sometimes it gets pretty hard, but as time passes, it gets more complicated to find places that don't have the footprint of people on them and that are not altered in some way. We just plan the trips and then when the weather is good, we, we just take a shot at it. And how long would a typical shoot last? Is it like a just a day trip or do you guys actually go and camp out and you know get further along into the woodlands or wherever you happen to be? Well, most of them are just a day long because it's easier like that, planning and actually shooting something. But we also do trips that last for two or three days. 
Uh, it's harder that way because we have to carry everything like tents and uh, food and uh, photo equipment. It all just adds up and uh, it can get pretty heavy. You said that you'll do some research in advance for where you might want to shoot. What is it that you look for when you're planning a shoot specifically? I think we are searching for a feeling rather than a place. I think that's the most important thing regarding our work, the atmosphere, the feeling surrounding a place, and also the feeling that the viewer gets when seeing an image. I, I feel the same way. It's typically the feeling that leads me to a place. Over here, I'm limited geographically in terms of where I'm able to go and, and do shoots. I do have mountains and, and the shoreline and whatnot. But really, it's more the feeling that I have on a certain day. I know, for example, one day when I was walking my, my son to school, it happened to be an, uh, an overcast, foggy day. And just the feeling I had just walking through the woods, I was trying to capture that that day with those photos. Do you feel like when you're out in the forest that, I know this might sound corny, but do you think the forest tells you what to shoot? It, it gives you an idea of what you're trying to capture while you're there? Oh well, yeah, I think a lot of the photos are not taken, but given to us by nature. So we could spend a lot of time and not getting anything uh, really great. And then uh, a moment, just in a moment, something happens, a ray of light hits something and uh, everything just adds up and the photo turns out just great. Do you tend to edit your photos a lot after the fact or do you, are you able to capture exactly what you're looking for straight away? Well, it actually depends on the kind of photo that we take. All our photos are edited, of course, because if you take a look at them, there are a lot of uh, eerie, strange, out-of-this-world colors. The natural light isn't really that color. So we do our best to enhance them and make them uh, more true to what we felt when we took that photo. Do you ever feel like you're telling a story through your photos? Yes, I think our work actually sets the scene for a story more than anything. Uh, hopefully people can look at an image and instantly have a story in their mind. But uh, what the story is, it's up to their imagination. I like to think of some of our images as kind of a backdrop for daydreaming. That comes across very clearly. And it's something I can relate to because I feel like I write with a very visual style. The words that I use, I use them to convey what I'm seeing in my mind. When I'm writing, it's almost like there's a movie playing in my head, and I'm just sort of serving as the vessel to get those images into the best description possible. That's also what drew me instantly to your work, because I saw the words in your images. As a matter of fact, for anybody listening, Andre and I had a project that we did together called Dark Dreams. He shared an image with me, and the moment I saw it, the first thing I heard was this howling wind, and immediately this story began to write itself in my mind. And so I was able to find the right music to serve as a backdrop, and I just wrote this really, really short story and incorporated his dark visual imagery into it. And I think it lent itself to a bigger idea for something that uh, we'll discuss further along. It actually served as a proof of concept for this pretty significant project that we have coming up. Andre, would you like to discuss a little bit of your work for this audio-visual project that we have? Yeah, sure. So it's not something that uh, we normally do, so it's a bit out of our comfort zone. But together with my brother, who is also a talented illustrator, we have tried to recreate scenes from your books. We have been using some more mediums that we are usually used to, like uh, illustration, 3D rendering, coupled with photography, in order to create something out of the ordinary. And that's actually what I love about it. I've seen great photographers who are able to capture a really beautiful scene, whether it's a sunset, you know, over the mountains or just something interesting. But you and your brother, you guys create whole worlds with these images. And I've just been incredibly impressed and extremely thankful that you've been willing to work with me on this project. Just to dive a little more deeply into it. I'm intending on recording audiobook versions of my Cosmogonia series, and what I'm hoping to do is take the audio that I'll record and pair it with a variety of music and sound effects and add a visual element 
so that it really brings the whole thing to life. Because like I said, when I'm writing these books, it's a very multimedia experience. I, I listen to music when I write. Sometimes I hear music in my head as I'm writing. And so for me, I try to convey as much of that as I can, but there's a limit to what the words can do, especially from the visual aspect. Knowing what you and your brother are capable of, it really elevates, I, I feel like it elevates the words that I've tried to use to get those images across and you guys actually really bring them to life. So I'm very excited to work with you. And that won't actually be our first collaboration because thankfully I was able to use one of your images for my book cover for the Metamorphoses. I don't know if you remember that specific image or that trip where you, was it your brother's hands coming through the tree? Yes, it was actually my brother's hands coming through the tree. And uh, I remember it was really wet and muddy and uh, we had a great time. I think you said recently, were you able to find that exact location a second time? Yes, I think um, last fall we searched for that exact tree and we managed to find it. Oh, that's unbelievable. Now, you have so many other images that I fell in love with and uh, that you were kind enough to allow me to use as promotional materials. But what drew me to that specific image for the book cover is one of the, the main themes in the book, The Metamorphoses, is this internal change that happens. There's also a very literal chrysalis, and when I saw those hands coming out of the tree, it felt just like that moment of, of rebirth, if you will. When I saw just the way you guys had it framed with the lighting and everything, there was something ominous about it. I don't know if that was the intention, but that's how I interpreted it, that there's something coming out of this tree. First of all, the fact that it's like life being born out of nature, I thought was really cool. And so I really felt like there was a moment of danger or threat in that image. And that's what I really, really enjoyed about it. Did you have a specific aim for that one? Or was it just something you guys kind of did randomly? Yeah, I think we were kind of trying to do something out of the Lord of the Rings, maybe with some creature go going out from the ground and being born. Oh, I think you captured that perfectly. And so for me, I loved it the way that it was, but I felt like there was something, just some extra detail that I could add to it to try to bring it closer to the book. And so I just caught on a whim, I copied the pinky finger from one of the hands and pasted it at the end. So it was a subtle detail that showed that something wasn't right with whatever was coming out of the tree. No offense to your brother, of course. <laughs> and so it was just a minor detail. But what was funny was when I was given the opportunity to go to my daughter's first grade class at the time and give a presentation about writing, I had that book with me. And I was amazed because I was discussing developing the cover and, and how as a writer, you get to do things that go beyond just writing the book. And my daughter's friend in the first row pointed out that I think she said something like, wow, that guy has an extra finger on his hand. And I was amazed because this was a, a six or seven year old girl a really minor detail, and she picked up directly on it. And for what it's worth, if I've never mentioned this, the kids were all completely blown away by the photography that I shared with them. So it's great to know that your work resonates with people of, of all ages and experiences and, and backgrounds. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, and actually, that's a great little detail, the extra finger. Uh, I wish we would have thought of that. <laughs> what I love about your work, too, is you guys manage to almost give the natural world a fantasy feel to it. And it's so important as a writer to emphasize like the setting and symbolism in there. And for me, in The Metamorphoses, from that point forward, I went from the characters inhabiting the real world shifting more towards a fantasy realm. And it was really difficult for me because I had to essentially build this entire world. I had to create different creatures and histories and whatnot. Now, I know in Eastern European cultures, there are really strong oral histories with all sorts of fantastic creatures. Do you feel like something like that exists in Romania and, and your personal culture? Yes, definitely. As you know, Transylvania has a lot of folklore and legends surrounding it. I can see where Bram Stoker got his inspiration, but there is also a lot of folklore and stories that I learned from my grandparents. Stuff that's never been written and just been passed by word of mouth. I remember that uh, being as a kid, I was pretty scared about those stories, but I found them really interesting nevertheless, and I still do. I feel, I feel like a lot of those types of stories, that's exactly the purpose of them, right? In essence, it's just a method for the older generations to keep the children obedient so that they're afraid of maybe going into the woods at night or playing with fire or, or you know, yes. something to that effect. 
Do you happen to have any references that you could share with us or perhaps some of the creatures that you remember? Well, a lot of the normal known ones like vampires and walking deads of all sorts, shapeshifters, an old witch living in the woods, something like that. I think it's called Baba Klonza. Some creatures take into werewolves, other that kind of resemble a Sasquatch, as I see it. All sorts of spirits and ghosts, a lot of them uh, tied to nature. There, There's a lot of stuff. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, like Hansel and Gretel from Germany, it seems to be common throughout that part of Europe in terms of the uh, the folklore. Yeah, I think a lot of the stories are kind of the same in Eastern Europe. Also, yeah, the Germans have a lot of great stories, great dark stories. I think fantasy is important because it allows people to inhabit these imagined realms where the impossible becomes possible. What's your take on fantasy, either as a genre or just as a general concept? I actually love fantasy in books, in movies, music, images, anything. I love it how they they paint a, a mental image and you get transposed to that place. I guess you guys manage to make the impossible seem real, if that makes sense. Where, like you said, you'll do different setups with, with different lighting, and it almost feels to me as if like a portal has been opened to some other realm, and there's an overlapping of worlds, you know what I mean? Yeah, and in a way that's true, because that does exist in our minds, and we try to make it real somehow. I strive from the very first pages of my very first novel to make the fantastic feel believable. I wanted people to read the events in the stories and believe that they could actually happen, maybe not just even to the character, but perhaps to themselves, no matter how fantastic it became. That was sort of the goal that I had with trying to convey something fantastic, but still grounding it in reality. Part of the inspiration for me when I'm writing is the music that I'm listening to. And early on, when I was writing The Line in the Desert, I have a specific soundtrack, but it really consisted more of, of regular songs, like actual songs with lyrics versus what I would consider ambient or background music. And then I stumbled on an amazing composer named Adrian von Ziegler. I think he's based out of Switzerland. Uh, I'll have to double check. But Adrian von Ziegler creates these incredible soundscapes that enabled me to inhabit the spaces in my head in ways that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. There's desert songs, the forest songs really were the ones that were the best. And that's something that I'm really excited about with our project, is being able to incorporate his music to bring your forests to life. One of my favorite pictures, actually, you help to create what's called the Phantom Forest. And there's some really great music that will back that up. And so in terms of music in general, in my last episode, I spoke about how music transcends all different sorts of constraints, whether continental or cultural. Now, you and I grew up roughly 7,000 kilometers apart, a little more than that, actually, and at roughly the same time. I think there's only five years between us. But what's funny to me is we actually have nearly identical musical taste. Yeah, I find that really interesting, too. What kind of bands do you like specifically, just for, for our listeners? Well, I like Slipknot, and I know you're a big fan of Slipknot. <laughs> yep. And people who don't listen to aggressive music, I don't think they understand. Like, when I listen to Slipknot, for as angry as those songs are on Iowa, right, or on the self-titled album, or even We Are Not Your Kind, it doesn't make me angry. It's actually, it sort of expiates that darkness or that anger. Do you, do you feel that too when you listen to that kind of music? Yeah, I think that's what got me into them in the first place that dark feeling that something out of the ordinary out of this world just the atmosphere i know on iowa there are a lot of uh, more atmospheric pieces there i think i was drawn to those particular songs in the beginning and also gently i think yes gently yep that's another one how did you get into those bands like because i know you like slipknot and corn but how did you discover those bands on your own I guess it all started when I started listening to Linkin Park as a teenager. And from there on, I think the internet was not uh, as important as it is today. I used to buy metal magazines, some imported from Germany, where I saw these great bands and uh, posters. And uh, then I rushed to the CD store to see what I could find. Oh, that's awesome. And I don't know about you, but I don't envy modern musicians who are trying to make it today. 
I feel like it's probably not any easier for folks in any art medium, at least where you want to maintain artistic integrity. But it seems like it's especially difficult for musicians now to get the same sort of footing that, say, Linkin Park had back in the day. Because I remember I was a part of their street team in the early 2000s. I wasn't a part of the initial wave because they started out on the West Coast. And obviously in New York, it took a while before we heard of them. But once I was involved with that, it was a really fun experience. We got stickers and promotional materials and stuff. And so we were tasked with going out and spreading the word and and really doing it word of mouth. Now with the internet, I guess it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because there's the opportunity for exposure, whether you're a musician or a photographer or a writer, but there's just such a surfeit of material out there. It's like our work feels like it's being strangled. Yes, it's actually kind of an inflation of art. And it's hard to stay relevant in this field. So you always have to try new things. Some work better than others. So you have to be you have to be selective, take choices and stand by those choices. Right. I think you need to be forward thinking if you want to excel. I know I can't really speak too much on anything beyond writing, even with music or photography, because I'm not involved in the commercial areas of those creative outlets. But I know as a writer, the problem too is there's no vetting process anymore. So as much as I love the writing community, there are a lot of folks who may not have the the necessary writing background, or they may have not gone through the process of of really having their work edited or, or assessed. And if they did, maybe they just ignored the input and the advice. And so their work gets flooded out with everything else, and it becomes more difficult for the, the cream to rise to the top, as it were. As a photographer, what challenges have you faced with trying to get your work out there? Well, this is the biggest thing that there's a lot of photographer out there now and everybody's doing photography, like a lot of the folks are doing music. And just because they can, it doesn't mean they actually should. I mean, everyone should be a bit more self-critical and see if um, an image or a song or something is really good or we just feel it as it's good in that particular moment. I think that's a great point. And I hadn't considered that. But with advances in technology, you know, obviously, there's a lot of positives to it. But there are also some negative aspects, too. There's a huge difference between someone snapping a photo and someone composing a photograph. So I guess in the same sense that I'm competing against other writers who are able just to upload their documents and not have to go through any sort of vetting process, folks can do the same with photography. Yes, I think a lot of the arts have been truly liberalized now, but that means that you have to go through a lot of bad things to find the good things. So it's harder to find something truly unique these days. It's also much harder to get people to pay for things. And that's what frustrates me just in terms of a consumer of art. I guess this goes back to the Napster days, right? When uh, Napster and Metallica had that whole falling out. I know back then I bought a lot of CDs, but the problem was the prices here inflated ridiculously. There were times where one store would charge 10 US dollars for an album and another store, say in Times Square in Manhattan, would charge $25 for the same CD. It it just, it felt like greed was dominating the market and it backfired on them because now nobody pays for music essentially. Do you feel the same is true when it comes to like artwork? Yes, that's definitely true. I mean, um, if you can get something for free, then why pay for it? Right. And you have your work on a variety of sites. I know Stocksy was one of the bigger ones you were using. Do you feel like that was a viable place to get your work out and and to actually get people to purchase it or? Yeah, Stocksy, those guys are actually really cool about everything. They um, keep communicating with artists. They um, pay a lot more than other websites. So yeah, I think that was an important step for my work to, to become part of Stocksy. But I found that people who would uh, not pay for an image won't pay no matter what. And people who need it and want to pay and uh, try to license it for something more serious, uh, those guys are going to go to sites like Stocksy and get them there. And uh, I think they pay more not for the digital asset, but for the um, chance of using it for, for the license. Right. Well, I, I'm noticing a cultural shift in that regard where uh, NFTs are concerned. Is that something that you think you and your brother will explore or do you view it maybe just as a passing fad? I don't think we're going to explore it. I don't think NFTs are good. <laughs> I know for me personally, I'm not terribly interested in it. I understand what they're going for with it. It speaks more to a cultural issue for me. 
people want to feel special and they sort of take the the path of least resistance to get there and so feeling like you quote unquote own something that essentially doesn't exist right it's this ephemeral digital artifact i don't know i'd i'd rather put my money towards something else and and that's the thing like i feel like part of the purpose of this episode this podcast episode was to give this notion that for all the geographic distance between us, we're all creative people. And whether we're consumers of those creations or the inventors of them, we should support each other. And so that's what I like to try to do. My hope is someday to have a platform where I can promote your photography and Adrian Von Ziegler's music and my friend Chauncey and, and Anthony's artwork and really get it out there because it feels like we're all screaming at once and it's just a matter of trying to get our voice heard above the rest. Yeah, definitely. And um going back to NFTs, I think the idea is really interesting. I mean, when I first heard about it, I thought that's actually that actually makes sense, but seeing how it's actually implemented, that's where I have my doubts. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Avenged Sevenfold. I'm sure you've heard of the band, but I don't know if you know about their involvement yeah, sure. with the NFT market. I, I would definitely check that out because they're trying to do it in a much different way where there's an entire asset community that they're trying to build where the tickets themselves are NFTs. And there's almost like a, a collector's mentality where if you accrue a certain number of, of, say, digital tokens or digital ticket stubs that you can then redeem them for personal private interactions with the band and stuff it's actually pretty cool and i commend them for trying to do something different great i'll check them out so in terms of your favorite photographers do you have any inspirations or or anyone that you looked to when you were starting out well i really like ansel adams as a landscape photographer um so do you have any favorite memories or, or any particular photo shoots that stand out in your mind well, I think that would be when we first started shooting forests, foggy forests. I think it was uh, back in 2009 in the summer. A lot of the fog that I've seen in your photos, that's not added in post-edit. That's actually part of the environment. Yeah, the fog is actually there. That's the, that's the beauty of it. And the, the trick is to, to get the right conditions. That's more difficult to do. I give you guys a lot of credit because it's definitely beautiful in an eerie sort of way, but I think I would also be terrified <laughs> if I was out in the woods and they suddenly, you know, were filled with fog and, and do you guys ever feel uncomfortable or, or does it just sort of feel like second nature to be in, the, in those environments for you guys? Well, there were a couple of times when we had that feeling of uh, we got to get out of here, but it was mostly at night. I mean, um, photo shoots extended uh, way beyond what we initially thought. Night came, we had to use small flashlights to find our way. And yeah, a couple of times things got really interesting. Do you do macro photography as well? Yes, we love macro photography. So I've seen some of the images are just otherworldly. And it's it's weird. I, I guess the best way I can describe it is it's like ethereal biology, because sometimes I feel like we're, we're zooming in to, you know, a bloodstream, but it could just as easily be something out in space, really. Can you tell us a little more about the types of subjects that you use for the macro photography? Yeah, sure. So I think that's actually my second favorite uh, type of photography after the nature forest stuff. I really love abstract macro photography because you can see a lot of things, a lot of concepts that uh, might be or might not be there. A lot of the times they relate to biology. We have also did microscope photography. Oh, that's really interesting. So you have a microscope that you have connected to photographic equipment or how, how does that work? Yeah, we actually use an adapter to hook up the, the camera with the microscope and get some interesting images. And we use some strange techniques to, to enhance them and they sometimes work. It's, it's really fascinating seeing that uh, there's a world beyond our world and it's a lot of the times it's uh, under our feet and we can see it. So yeah, the microscope is uh, another gate to, to that world. Have you actually used blood as a subject? Because I was curious with a couple of the images that I saw if, if that's what it was that you were using. Uh, no, actually, the bloodstream images were something else, something like um, paint and paint thinner and stuff like that. But they look like that. And that's what I was saying. Um, 
a lot of the times the the concept just seems right. It's funny that you mentioned that, right? That these worlds exist just outside of our view, beneath our feet, sometimes even directly on and inside of our bodies. And it's really just a matter of perspective, right? If you're able to shrink yourself, I guess like in the Marvel movies, right? Ant-Man and the Wasp, if you enter the quantum realm, things look completely different. It's it's almost like another world that's packed in to, um, to the larger one. Yeah, and uh, there's always something to shoot in this um, microscopic realm. It's It's really interesting. I could see myself doing that uh, over the years. Obviously, you know, you have your photography available on Stocksy, but you guys have branched out into other realms too, right? Would you like to to discuss a little bit of of that, perhaps the book covers or other digital imagery that you guys work on? Yeah, sure. So uh, we also started doing book covers because we saw that a lot of our images were used for this purpose. So we said, uh, why not do it ourselves? And um, we've launched photocoverdesign.com a couple of years ago. And how has that been going so far? It's been going great with the clients that we've, we've had. We could always use more, of course, but um, they are they have been really supportive. They have been, um, they had a lot of great ideas. I mean, I like working with writers, yeah. It's funny, I was discussing this recently with somebody. I find it much, much harder to write a three-sentence blurb explaining what my book is about than writing a 400-page book. And I know it's a trite saying, but it said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And believe me, your work and your brother's work, it's worth a hundred thousand words or a hundred times that. You guys are able to create and to convey things that even my imagination can't comprehend. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast but more importantly, to have gotten the the chance to know you and to work with you on these collaborations. I'm really, really excited and I'm really looking forward to what we're going to create with this audiovisual book. And hopefully there's plenty of success ahead for, for both of us. And I know I just want to keep doing my part to try to spread the word about your work because I feel like it's incredibly important for people to see your images. You go well beyond being just a a photographer or even just a digital artist. There's something truly special in what you do. And I hope that anybody who's listening to this podcast will take the time to go and and look at your work and see just the unbelievable, incredible things that you create. Thank you so much. For anyone listening who is interested in checking out your work, what's the best place that they can do that? I think that would be my website, photocosma.net. Whoever wants to find me can find a lot of info there. All right. I want to say thank you to Mr. Andre Cosma for spending some of his day with me here and to all of you for listening whenever and wherever you are. Have a great day. 